Welcome everyone to Tia No, the Lasses of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Muckle Lover, and today we are beginning a new campaign as the West Siberian People's Republic, also known as Tumem. Or that's how I pronounce it, but we're led by Kazar Kaganovich. And I'll be honest, when I see this guy, he reminds me of Mario from like Nintendo. I don't know why, but maybe it's a hat, maybe it's the face, but if you'd like to read about the West Siberian People's Republic, please go right ahead. But uh we our leaders do not adhere to orthodox communism. Cool. And actually we start off with fairly strong, so that's going to be fun. Let's hope so. And we will start with a focus. The clock breaks. Um, oh, look at that. We have focuses. Okay. We have a lot of focuses done already. Or not done, but yeah, unavailable. Holding out. The territories of the former Soviet Union have never been seen darker days than the ones that can experience. Petty warlords wage war against, amongst themselves, and all the while, the hated fascists who started the misery send their dreadful or dreaded Luftwaffe to terrain death and destruction right on top of our heads. Indeed, the cruel fascists of the Reich are simply not content with their previous defeats and would prefer not to go a step further. By kicking the Russian people while they are down, the state of affairs cannot continue. Jimin Kaganovich, here is a plight of those who suffer, and with his new, with his aid, new strategies will be undertaken to mitigate the worst of the damage. And we have quite a few things here. Oh, and before we go too far, let's make sure we get some divisions going. I forgot about that. Infantry is always good, but we do start with some IFVs, which I normally don't like using them because, in my opinion, they're just weaker tanks. But they do have a role, so actually that's not too bad. A little less than 30 armor. If we get, if someone has anti-tank, they can probably pierce us. But really, not too bad. And we, do, we have an okay amount of manpower to begin with. Not bad. But we do have the National Spears. Luftwaffe uh, terror bombing. We've got a revisionist remnants. Not bad. Pretty good. Unorthodox Bolshevism. We love it, right? Uh, the Ural Automotive Plant is very nice. Very, very nice. As well as Lenin's Mausoleum. Oh, that's where Lenin's Mausoleum is. Oh, that's kind of cool. Nice. We get more... How much? 1.27 a day. Not bad. Not bad. We can close that one out. And the ghost of Stalin. Long live the Communist Party of Lenin Stalin. Long live General Secretary of the West Siberian Communist Party, Comrade Lazar Kaganovich. Long live the people of Russia, the people, the cause of the people, and the Red Army who keep us safe. Death to the Black League and arms who have betrayed the revolution and will ruin to all of Russia. Or will bring ruin. Death to the madman Karbyshev, who leads them and wishes to plunge our once glorious nation into darkness. Death to the traitors of the Red Army Sverdlovsk, who have threatened to destroy our glorious military and threatened to destroy our glorious nation. And death to the treacherous field marshal Rodkovsky, who leads this revolt against the glory of Comrade Kaganovich. When the traitor Bukharin assigned Comrade Ka Kaganovich to Western Siberia, he did not realize that he would be setting the path for his own demise. When he showed his true colors and failed to stop the hated German scum from destroying our beautiful nation, Comrade Comrade Kaganovich led a glorious civil war against Bukharin in the name of his former comrade Yosef Stalin. While the Union fell, Kaganovich never ceases, uh, never ended his cause and formed the Great People's Republic of Western Siberia. The time did not prove our ally, however, as the traitors in Omsk and Svedlovsk betrayed the revolution and launched a surprise attack on the capital of TMM. While we bravely held out and stopped these attacks, the People's Republic now lies dead. With the German bombing still pummeling what little we have to dust. The situation has now lasted for over a year. Soon, however, we will find a way to bring justice to these traitors and restore the Union for the glory of Comrade Kaganovich and Comrade Stalin and Comrade Lenin for the people. Ura, ura. Cool. And I would like to raid, especially with with our one APC, APC division, no, IFV division. So, this is a weird campaign start where I'm, I'm actually building IFVs. Very, very weird. But, bunker building. The underground world. Let's go with the underground world. The surface has been a land of death and misery for many years now, and our people are finding it much safer to seek brighter opportunities underground. Who are we to stop them? As a matter of fact, there is great wisdom in this trend, and we should do, and we would do well to embrace it with open arms. The chairman himself has given the go-ahead to begin the construction of vast underground complexes, which will serve a large variety of roles, from industry to dwellings. Ideas have been even proposed for the entire military bases to be built underground, such as the canny ingenuity of a truly social society, to find hope in the most unlikely of places while in the darkest of minds, or darkest of times, minds, times, whatever it may be. Not bad. And holding up, so... Let's see. Oh, the modern bogatier. If you'd like to read about that, please go right ahead. This happens every campaign, but we're led by an authoritarian socialist, Kaganovich, and assassin strikes of Mr. Hitler. We have the German flag here, or the red, white, and black, so libertarian socialism. We have authoritarian democracy, as well as ultranationalism, the burden we bear, which we'll read just after we click on this one. Thank you. Oh, Bowman, very good. Comrade, there's no denying that things are hard. The Soviet Union was great, but... 
Treason, fascism, and revisionism has whittled it down to a husk of its former self. Nevertheless, we're the true successors untainted by Bukharanism or any other deviation from the path of Marx, Lenin, and Stalin. The traitors can slander us, subvert us, bomb us, and murder us. They cannot murder the righteous spirit of the working class, though. <clears throat> Comrade, being reassured by the fact that the Communist Party has made, any sacrifices, has made many sacrifices in your name, Chairman Kaganovich, the works day and night striving to protect you from Nazism and warlordism. The Red Army stalwart as ever sends vigilant against the bandits who would harm you. The finest government in Russia makes the hardest decision so that you can live without fear. Comrade, if you feel discouraged, remember this. All of our hardships, all of our enemies have carved us into a point sharper than a bayonet. Are we, as we pierce through our adv 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 adversaries, ask yourself about a question. How can you serve by devoting every fiber of my cause, to, of my being, to the communist cause? Cool. Uh, we can invest in this stuff. We might, but we do start with 12 factories, which is not bad. Some, some, you know, Russian warlords don't even start with, you know, 10. But how about we read what? <clears throat> Bunker building? For every day that the bombs fall, the people of our republic have nowhere to hide and are forced to flee for their lives with a fear so palpable it haunts their dreams. The death tolls are rising by the day, and something must be done to give the people a place to seek shelter when the Luftwaffe arrives once more to reap their bloody harvest. <clears throat> The answer? More bunkers. Every city, town, shall soon have a formidable system of bunkers that will serve as an unbreakable bomb shelters in times of peace, an effective form of defense in times of war. Our republic shall become a great fortress, completely unable to be breached by air or land, as we should right now. Begin to start thinking about who we can beat up, because we love beating people up. They have three divisions? <clears throat> Let's see. Omsk. I would love to beat the crap out of Omsk, but probably these guys down here, because we are right here. Yeah, probably this group down here. Costagne. Very good. We're going to need a lot of uh, weaponry, especially guns. Thank you. Hopefully they refuse and we just get loot. Because we do have one loot. Oh, hold on. No, we have two loot. Okay, let's go with equipment then. Nice. I do want to save some of this political power for when we need core things and maybe other defense, but we're using... Uh, also, I didn't let you know which mods we're using. Uh, State Chancellor Tool Mod, TNO, as well as Player of the Peace Conferences. Pretty much the tried and true standard stuff, so. Not bad. Not bad. Okay, they paid the tribute. Great, thank you. Under the Earth. Waiting in the hall outside the local party secretary's office, Igor could feel his hands trembling. By God, if only the workers had delegated a different foreman of the make the report. He rehearsed the statement and he said, Comrade Secretary, some of the men have concerns about the safety of these bunker construction plans. They feel as though the plans, as written, would produce structures at an intolerable risk of collapse. Of course, this is not to say that you, Comrade Kaganovich, or the Communist Party have done even a single thing to jeopardize the safety of the people of Tiumen. If it could be that the plans have been sabotaged by counter-revolutionaries or incompetence among the workers, I would completely accept responsibility. A few more minutes of waiting and rehearsing went by before the door finally opened, and the secretary, a short, bored-looking Armenian, emerged from his office. Despite his efforts, Igor's statement came out in a nervous torrent, but the secretary shushed him before he could even get to the mandatory praise of Kaganovich. Yes, yes, safety concerns. I'll let my superiors know. As the man closed the door, Igor felt relief wash over him in a wave. All that was left to do was hope that the message would climb the chain of phone calls to Kaganovich himself and that the famously stubborn leader of two men would heed it. Who are we if we're going to keep the people safe? We must prioritize efficiency overall to house everyone. This would increase our construction speed at the cost of population growth. Um, I like that, but you know what? I don't know if there's any mul multiple, multiple routes for two men, so oh, who are we if we're not keeping the people safe? I think that was better. We get more stability. And we lose some political power, but we're, we kind of have an excess of political power right now, so I'm kind of okay with that. And bunker building. Yes, very nice. Very, very nice. Let's see. Military holdouts. Bunkers. We really are going crazy with trying to build bunkers. Oh, we get radar and technology. Let's go with that one. Rapid carav caravaneering. Caravaneering. Yet another necess necessity caused by the bombing raids of the system of caravans that have formed the lifeline of the, in the devastated regions of Russia. Unfortunately, the fascists have already caught on to the most common routes. Used by the caravans have begun launching strikes with the specific goal of cutting off our supplies and transit. In the interest of avoiding such disasters in the future, we shall begin to devise new routes for caravans intended to expose them to as little risk of being intercepted by the many dangers of the Russian no man's land as possible. Although these unfamiliar new routes will take some getting used to for our caravaneers, the continued influx of supplies will surely be worth any potential inconvenience that may arise. Oh no, someone wants to beat us up from Kok Chital. Uh, which one's uh, uh, other down here? Oh, Kok Chital, you're going to make us feel really good as we dance above your dead body attackers. 
Oh, you guys have upgrades. Oh, Panzer. Oh, you are a Panzer leader. Oh, yeah, I'll go with more defense. Why not? Combined arms is nice and all, but... And we've... Oh, yeah. Oh, we have no more command power. That sucks. And... Oh, crap. Um... If we can win fast enough, we can probably defend against Tomsk. Or, yeah, Tomsk, not Omsk. Okay, the enemy's defeated. If you'd like to read about this, please go right ahead. Thank you very much. Kolonev. Um, people really want our loot, don't they? <laughs> oh, boy. Aviators of the People's Republic. A plant foreman at his station just outside two men curses air, siren, uh, air raid siren went off. They knew that, as always, his factory would be a primary target for the incoming bombers, and also that regardless of whatever damage was inflicted upon it, Chairman Kaganovich would demand that the production levels remain constant, with woe to those who could not deliver. Performing his actions with well-practiced proficiency, the foreman stopped the line and directed the workers into the underground shelter that had been recently constructed on one benefit, he supposed, of the drive to move so many things underground, if only the whole factory could follow. As the bombs grew closer, the foreman thought to keep himself calm in front of his workers, despite the number of bombings he had been through. He never managed to entirely suppress the panic he felt when the bombs fell immediately immediately close. And as the noises grew, he knew that the moment was fast approaching, and then it didn't, and the noises started to come from a strange direction. One man volunteered to look outside, and when he returned his eyes, when he returned his eyes, the grin were wild. The aviators had arrived, ambushing their bombers and forcing them to scatter. In an instant, the foreman's panic was replaced with savage glee, the same emotion appearing on the faces of the other workers as well. Today, the Germans were not learning that the Germans, the Russians could, and would, fight back. He didn't know how many would die, shot to pieces, or incinerated in their burning aircraft, but he, they hoped, it was a lot. The fact that production would not suffer was an added bonus. A boon in every sense of the word. Alright, so are we up here? Just because we need to get... Oh, we need more organization before we let them go, so... Oh, and we have our focus, too. Nice. Come on, get more organization. We don't want to fight a battle without enough organization. How's our IFVs getting more organization than our infantry? Alright, then. Not bad. And then we shall read the next focus with... Living in the Shadow. The bombing, bombings are only getting worse as time goes on, and our already weak industry is being stretched to the absolute limits. As a result, production is more sluggish than we'd like, and the slow pace has come at the cost of less supplies and equipment reaching the front lines. To ensure that our military stands ready to face any kind of foe, even under these circumstances, perhaps it may be necessary to make even more sacrifices, and we defeated the enemy. A considerable portion of our production capabilities are devoted towards producing goods for the civilians, theoretically. Diverting production of civilian goods would provide a substantial boost to the production of arms and equipment for our troops. But, is it really worth taking away what little luxuries our people still have access to? The final decision will rest with Chairman Kaganovich. Get the event hidden away. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. And time for some coffee, my friends. And we have about eight days left. Not bad. Keep scavenging for Luke because people just want to beat the crap out of us. Who are you? Ivan Fedyaninsky. Hmm. Konev. We love Konev. He's going to be very aggressive. Very aggressive. You know what? Um, I don't mind if they keep attacking us. I really don't mind it. Uh, I like getting more supplies and experience, so yeah. And that's just almost like free political power, free XP, so. Uh, we, we are going straight for artillery immediately just because it's so strong and continuing to do our research bonuses, so. <clears throat> I suppose we can use this just a little bit. Oh, industrial investment. Oh, we need more slots for building slots. Okay, there you go. There you go. Maybe we'll try this one. 10%. Are we producing anything? Oh, we are slowly trying to produce stuff, so you know what? We'll do this one and that one, and that's all we're going to do. Desertus from Svedlusk. Earlier this morning, clad in the crushing veil of the Siberian night, a small group of people snuck through the fortifications along the northern frontier and crossed the border, where they were quickly apprehended by our military patrols. The group was mostly men, though there were several women and children with them. They claimed to desert from Rokosovsky's petty little junta and seeking refuge in Tumem, the current torchbearer of the International Socialist Revolution. This unusual crowd seemed surprisingly educated on her socialist ideals, despite coming from the reactionary side of Sverdlovsk. They might also have valuable information we could use against them. However, some of our language, some of their language is ripped straight from Marx and Stalin's writings almost to the letter. It's entirely possible that these men and women are spies who have been sent to destabilize the government. What should be done with them? Let them in solidarity? Have them detained and interrogated. Yeah, let's have them interrogated. You can't trust anybody. This is about survival. You can't trust anyone in the, the warlord uh, kingdom of Russia right now. Kingdom? It's not a kingdom. Well, you know what I mean. But then we'll be studying the bombings. <clears throat> the Luftwaffe darkened the skies with their sinister presence, unleashing death upon the innocent people of our republic on a near daily basis. Perhaps, though, the frequency of the bombings could yet prove to be the fascist undoing? Some more astute comrades in the remnants of our air forces have noticed that certain patterns are beginning to emerge in the bombings, but they cannot know for sure unless there's an effort is taken to study them in detail. 
Good. We should begin taking notes of the fascist bombings from here on out. The timetable of the attacks will be carefully analyzed to see if obvious patterns in the raids truly do exist with any luck. Our comrades will be able to predict exactly where and when the bombs will fall and true efforts to mitigate the majority of their damage can be begin in earnest. We get radar detection, great, and technology. The results of this project will be done later on. That's fine with us. Uh, agriculture methods, because that's the second best one. Oh, Sverdlovsk is up there. Siberian Black League, as well as the Siberian Central Republic. We could probably beat them up. Sver How's wrong with Sverdlovsk? Led by Rokosovsky. Four divisions. They have up to eight. Uh, hmm. You know what? Maybe I'll try to beat these guys up again. It might go well, it might not. I'm going to risk it. I'm probably not going to do well here, but that's okay. Head in away. Nursing a cup of coffee at his desk, Lazar Kaganovich yawned deeply. A brief glance at the clock told him that it was nearly midnight, meaning that he had been in his office reading reports and authorizing various state functions all day long. Rebuilding a nation was hard work, and yet there was plenty of luck to do before he could re retire for the night. Just then, uh... An aide, event, evidently quite tired, also. Enter the room. Kaganovich's sides were expected to keep the uh, aides were expected to keep the same schedule he did, and few had ir Iron Lazar's endurance. I have another report for you, sir, concerning the state of our industrial development. The chairman made a brief grunt at the, of the acknowledgement before dismissing him and shifted in a seat to read the document. It had something to do with increasing production, like so many of the other community keys that he had read that day. His eyelids sunk before uh, he caught himself in the act. He, was, he really was exhausted. He thought to himself, he continued reading. The document in very dry bureaucratic language enumerated the possibility of reducing the production of consumer goods to hasten that of heavy machinery. It, bre it reflected briefly on the effects of civilians before dismissing the concern. They had already put up with so much for the sake of the nation. Why not just a little bit more? The idea of retiring to his quarters now and leaving the matter until the morning floated in his mind before he pushed it aside. The Soviet Union had no use for a leader who couldn't dis discipline himself. He pondered for a few more minutes before, as he had done many times before, taking out a pen and writing his decision on the document. Do it, they'll enjoy luxuries later. Decrease the consumer goods requirements as a result of our survival program. They just deserve their small victories. As a result of our survival program. Uh, population growth really probably doesn't mean too much right now, honestly. Like, we will do that one. Why not? Okay, hopefully we can win here, since these motor rush did show up. Come on. Alright, never mind, we won. Love it. Now we're probably going to get our buoys rated as well. Brazil wins the World Cup. Good job, Brazil. Food for hungry. If you'd like to read about that, please go right ahead. But this happens every time. Guess we're not going hungry tonight. Great, great, great. And then, on the clock. Uh, but after a dark day. A day in the dark. That felt his muscles strain as he swung his pick. The rocks crumbled and showers were accrued with debris. He struggled to breathe. As of particulates... Uh, of uh, the rock gave out, seemed to collect in his throat, and as he could feel his muscles weakening, it, it wouldn't, wouldn't be long now, he knew, until he would collapse and have to be dragged out of the dark tunnels and into the firmary. He also knew that he would be replaced in an instant, and that some other poor slob from the work camp would be forced down into the darkness to dig the tunnels until they collapsed. Liv had been in this labor camp for almost two years. He had run afoul of some party bylaw or, some, or another that had been exiled to the sex escape. His breath was coming in shallow gulps at this point, and he knew he was nearing the end. He might even be left to rot by the guards if he was especially unlucky. Before he could make his next move, he was stopped. In shock, he looked at the man who grabbed his shoulder. It was one of the guards, one of the mercenaries that were paid to supplement the garrison. Gently, the man took his pickaxe in one hand. With the other, he pushed a certain canteen into the hand, his hands before monitoring him or motioning him behind the group. The stranger then took his place on the line, swinging Lev's pick with a vigor that shocked him. Lev sat behind the line and drained greedily from the canteen, and his breathing returned to normal, and the aches in his body seemed to lessen. After ten minutes, he returned to the line. The strange guard took the opportunity to take over for the worker next to him. The guard kept an almost supernatural pace, even as he slowly cycled through almost every member of the work detail he never seemed to tire. When the commandant had called an end of the workday that day, Lev's crew walked out of the tunnels with smiles on their faces. They would never see the strange mercenary again. They collected his pay and left that next day, but they always remember him for taking up their burden. Penance takes many forms. And on the clock. Our efforts to study the fascist bombing rates have borne fruit. Thanks to our intensive analysis of the times, dates, and locations of the bombings, a highly conspicuous pattern did, in fact, emerge. The lift off his power in the air may be fearsome indeed, but it's clear to us now that these fascists are nothing if not predictable. Now that we can accurately and reliably predict where the bombing rates will happen, the next step will be to prepare paired potential targets for the raids in advance. Although we cannot stop the bombs from dropping for now, we can, at the very least, ensure that they land in areas where virtually no critical damage can be inflicted. There is indeed a light at the end of this tunnel, and we get more war support, which is great, because we have... Not much. Great. And we can do all that stuff, but we're not interested. And we're probably going to get raided soon enough, but hey, that's okay. Let's see. What, do we have the survival mechanic here or something? Because it keeps talking about survival. But, oh, there it is. Survival programs. Oh, yeah. That's consumer goods. Slightly more construction speed. Nice. I think that's really cool. That's really, really cool in my opinion. 
And then we'll go with hitting communes. Bomb shelters have proven to be an effective layer of protection for people, but their very nature means that those who still go about their business on the surface will have to maintain a keenly de developed sense of danger in order to make it to the shelters in time. To make matters worse, there's no telling what would happen should the Luftwaffe decide to harass us at night. Perhaps it would be wise to expand these shelters to serve another purpose. Underground bomb-proof homes for the people. If the people are living and working safely underground, then they would not even have to concern themselves with the arrival of the bomb ra bombing raids. But better yet, they'd finally be able to sleep at night knowing they wouldn't be awoken by a siren. Yes, very good. Very good. Oh, and I crack my back. Oh, boy. Nice. Keep scavenging for loot until we get raided. More stability, increase our population growth as a result of our survival programs. No legacy of the Siberian plan here, but... Uh, Comrade Secretary Kaganovich is doing a great job. Behind the times. Uh, let's do military holdouts. Now that plenty of bomb shelters have been made available for people, they can now sit in relative comfort and safety as the Luftwaffe attempts in vain to break their body spirit, but of what? The military. How can they hope to keep watch against the many enemies with explosives being rained down around their heads on a regular basis? Simple. We shall t build even more fortifications. This time, the locations of our fortified positions shall be chosen with the military in mind. The most likely lines of defense shall be turned into impenetrable redoubts that are mostly safe from any kind of aerial attack, as well as being well prepared for potential ground assaults. Good idea. Uh, we could beat those guys up. I might, might, might want to wait, though. Our program yields results. As always, with Chairman Kaganovich, his proposals to monitor the schedule of the German terror bombers have been ha has been an excellent success. The people well alerted of potential attacks have never been safer. And supply lines are moving better than ever. We can allow ourselves to be complacent. The Communist Party does not settle for inadequacy, but strives to achieve perfection. We figured out their schedule for now, but the Germans can always change it once they realize their ingenuity. It is for this reason that a more permanent solution to the bombings need to be put in place. One potential option is to use our knowledge of their movements to go on the attack. They learn that people badly need to blow against the fascists so that they think twice before menacing them again. The solution would involve building fighter planes to intercept the bombers midair using the elements of surprise to overcome the technology gap. Fascists are inherently cowardly, and the Luftwaffe is not accustomed to resistance. A decisive strike could scare them away from our airspace in favor of weaker targets. The next solution is more cautious, but with the potential of dealing with the problem for longer. Radar towers proved quite effective in prior wars, and their ability to remotely monitor aircraft would negate the need for detailed bombing schedules in the future since we could react to bombers as we detect them. This type of response, while not directly challenging the bombers, could severely curtail their efforts in the future. The German, brutish though they are, are not stupid. Whichever operation we will choose will need to be flexible and highly responsive in order to ensure it's not bypassed completely by a change in the loop office tactics. Focus on detecting the enemies? On the making interception viable. I kind of like radar. Let's go with detecting the enemies. No matter where they go, we will find them. Four divisions. Uh, I'm not really sure where we, we would do this if we tried to raid them, though. Ah, so it looks like right here. Which we might be able to do okay. I mean, it is 5v4. And they don't have any armor. Is that a river? That might be a river line, though. Hmm. We'll see. We shall see, my friends. And? Oh, oh there's technology. That's good. Even more artillery? Yes, please. Military holdouts. Oh. Anything else? Oh, yes. Oh, we, we have loot. Um, schools. Yeah, I'll do schools by now. Anything else here, really, that we care about? We could prepare the raid, I suppose. That's fine. We'll try it. Why not? These guys are probably pretty good, but... Hey, yeah, holy crap. That's, that's a very good division. Yeah, we're probably going to lose against these guys. That sucks. Oh, well... Uh, do you have any upgrades? Yvonne? Yes. Offensive. Uh, Panzer later, why not? Come on, please reject. Please reject. Alright, so, I guess we begin immediately. Can they pierce us? Hopefully not. But we're beating... Okay, we won! We got the loot! Oh, God, I love looting. I love the warlordism in Russia. It's so much fun to loot. Cool. Very nice. Oh, you're... The field marshal became the general. Um, okay. Mm, whatever. Sounds good to me. Alright, military holdouts. And then, what should we read next? And we'll look at our social development so far. Behind the times. Modern technology is all well and good, but what use is it if our factories are too damaged to produce them? The fact is, all of our luxuries of the modern world will have to wait until the People's Republic isn't getting pelted with bombs nearly every day, and we can actually get our industry back up and running again. Woof. 
The solution lies in providing the people with older, more antiquated goods. Although they are less convenient to use, they are much easier to produce, especially in a stressful times like ours. After all, when it rains death on a regular basis, or people would hardly be picky with what goods and services they have access to. In fact, they should consider themselves lucky that they're getting anything at all. Amen. Cool. Anything else? Nope. Nothing I really care about. We could get another factory, but I think I'm going to experiment with this this campaign and just save as much PP as possible. So when we get to the next stage, we can just keep like doing social developments. But bunkers in the distance. A plume of smoke exited Private Senislav's Senislav uh, Karatonev's lungs as he gazed out from the top of the hill. It was a crack of dawn earlier, even than the hour he was roughly shaking out of bed most days. What could he do? Or what could he be done? He was on watch, and his duty was to watch. The Red Army tolerated few things less than insubordination. At least he could smoke. He took in, took an appreciative drag on a cigarette and let his eyes pull to him to so something interesting. His vision centered on the bomb shelters placidly sitting in the distance, awaiting their purpose. It might have been the hour of the day, but his feeling complicative. He never quite appreciated how much of an achievement they were. After all, they had faced the collapse of the Union and the treason from within the General Corps. The collapse of the West Siberian People's Republic endured, at least in two men. No amount of bombs or bullets could keep the soldiers of the proletariat from taking back what was rightfully theirs. Sure, the army was strict. Just Stanislav and a thousand like him. That was nothing compared to the losses they had already suffered. The Red Army continues to stand triumphant. Scavenger's Paradise. Comrades, let us face the facts. The West Siberian People's Republic has seen better days. Most of its infrastructure lies in ruin, and countless scores of both civilian and military equipment has been lost to the chaos of the collapse. Now that we are making a serious attempt to get back on our feet, we desperately need that equipment back. Although, we currently lack the industry to produce goods ourselves, there are millions of valuable artifacts from better days that are simply lying out in the open waiting to be claimed. The green light has been given to execute a large-scale expedition into no man's land with the goal of rescuing as much lost material as we can with our luck. Our scavengers will come home with plenty of abandoned equipment just waiting to be put back to good use. Yes, yes, and Svedlosk. <sighs> Evils. Actually, we literally raided them, so actually, ooh, can we tell where we're going to get raided? Um, not really, but I'm going to assume like here, since they have their divisions over there too, so. Go back up. We'll defend as best as we can, and have a good time, shall we? Yes, we shall. Well, wow, total effective manpower modified to 128%. Not bad. Do we have organization yet? We do not. Give him a few more days. Six, six, five, four. We're not going to back down so easily. So, Go suck it. Can they pierce our IFBs? Uh, actually, yeah, they can. That sucks. Oh, they actually might win here. Uh, Magnogorsk. Well, as long as we can win here, that's the most important thing. Oh, it looks like we're winning. Come on. Yes. Yes, infinite wins, infinite wins. Don't let them throw more divisions in. Ah, we beat them up, my friends. But now we must come over here to Magne Magnetor Magnetogorsk. Magnetogor Mag Lysenko. He sounds familiar. He sounds very familiar. Hmm. Mad scientist. I should play with him sometime. I'm not sure how. Can they actually unite Russia? That'd be kind of cool if they could. Hopefully they can. Play them someday, too. Some days left. Get our guys down there. Get some organization. They don't look very strong. Two to four divisions. Like, no manpower. Okay. All right, then. Give them a few more days. I like that we have two weeks to wait for ultimatums. Oh, loot. Yes. Yeah, we should win pretty handily, maybe? Uh, what's in their template? Artillery. Ooh, more research speed, thank you. Yep, back into computing, please. Thank you. Oh, oh, we're, oh, they, oh, that's not good. Beyond the times. And let's scavenge, my friends. Scavenger's Paradise. Hopefully we don't lose here. We could lose. Oh, that's not good. That's really not good. We might win, though. Let's see. Survival Society. In these times, our focus should be less on comfort and more on survival. Our government decisions could be deciding, the deciding factor. Between life or death for hundreds of thousands, and sadly, there comes a time when difficult choices will have to be made. One, this is one of these times. The bombing impacts our noble republic on every level, from the innocent people who are helpless against the might of the Luftwaffe, to our military which suffers insurmountable casualties every week from the sheer volume of aerial attacks or strikes. It has become increasingly clear that we cannot save everyone, and a choice is presenting itself. Should we focus our efforts on protecting the innocent or preserving our military strength? Good question. Uh, let's win here first before we do anything. Oh, we actually were defeated a little bit. But we got more guns. And actually, how many guns? We have minus 2,000. That's not too bad. We were at minus 2,600 earlier. So, actually, that's not too bad. I'm kind of liking it.
Uh, let's go with infantry attack. Oh, we don't have enough command. No, we actually have enough command. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Nice. Very good, my friends. Hope we get that loot so people stop raiding us. <laughs> oh, there goes Guiana. Bye, Guiana. Now, unfortunately, out of coffee. Big sadness hours. So much political power, though. Oh, they're really going to be attacking us with horses, huh? All right, well, good luck with that. Oh, we can prepare against Omsk, huh? Oh, kind of a chef. 6,000 manpower is not very much. Oh, wow, that's fast. Uh, you know what? Screw it. We're going to do it. Oh, wait. We got more. Oh, we're, we're already here, so whatever. Nice. Very nice. Oh, I did say we were going to look at this. So, the is going up 2.25. Not bad. Actually, we might have been already going up by 0.25 anyways. Let's see. Research facilities, agriculture. Pirate rate is slowly getting worse. Industrial equipment is getting better. Industrial expertise is going up too. But everything else is pretty much stagnant, which is not bad. It could be worse. But survival society. Yes, please. Oh, sanctioned salvaging expeditions. The collapse of the Soviet Union left behind a large number of settlements, supply caches, factories, and other structures that its successor statelets never had the budget or ability to reclaim. The WSPR's recent turmoil has delayed our ability to organize large-scale expeditions, <clears throat> even with these circumstances. The workers win small, win small victories. We've located several salvageable sites in the vicinity of Tiumen. The first is a large store of fuel left behind from an armor division that never deployed. The second is a stash of military equipment abandoned after mass desertions. Least important for the war effort, and but potentially valuable for the morale, is, is a warehouse of food, clothes, and other civilian amenities. At this moment, we only have the resources for one, in our state of total mobilization. Fuel or arms would be invaluable. But there's also a question of how much people can bear. But not so hard in our hearts, choose amenities, not bad. A bigger gun, a longer life. Choose the arms. Our army needs to last, choose the fuel. Actually, that's probably the best thing we could do here. Even though we're maxed out on fuel, we'll probably get enough fuel as time goes on. We need more guns. We really do need more guns and support equipment, though. <clears throat> guns are not looking good, but if we keep raiding people, we'll do okay. We're going to go with fuel. Choose the fuel. We love fuel. Oh, we can purchase any take, but I'm not going to waste time with that. Oh, they paid tribute. Great. Thank you. We got more political power. Look at we almost have 500. The Mikhail system. Comrade Mikhail, brother to the chairman, has come forward with a wise proposal for further minimizing the impact of the bombings. He believes that it would be necessary it would be necessary to devote a significant portion of our efforts to mitigate the damage towards ensuring the safety of all personnel considering essential to our cause. Indeed, losing these highly important men and women in a near instant to one of the raids would spell disaster for the Republic. It is when this fact is considered that Mikhail's ideas begins to carry weight. Under his proposed system, we can both substantially increase the protection afforded to our central per personnel, while at the same time not being forced to abandon our people to their fate. We get more popularity of libertarian socialism. And how do we do this when the clock breaks? Oh. Oh, so basically Germany uh, has to be in civil war, Hitler has to be dead. Not bad. Keep going, artillery. I love artillery so much. We could do that, but that's so much. It's just better to save. We could just build roads later on. I don't mind doing this one, but... Mm. Actually, that's, that's actually a little bit smarter to do. Because this place ha makes the factories the least quickest, or the slowest, because of the infrastructure. So you might as well direct your efforts in trying to build infrastructure where you already have low levels of uh, infrastructure. So... Eh, 75, but we have so much political power already, it doesn't really matter too much. The Mikhail system, though. Emergency measures. Every bomb that drops is another one, another choice we must make. Who do we protect? Try as we might, there simply aren't enough bunkers in TMM uh, to make sure everyone is safe. And as with anything, there are trade-offs. Each soldier that survives is one that can contribute to the war effort. Many of our brass convincingly argue that we must prioritize the men who can drag us out of this miserable state. And yet, Chairman Kaganovich hesitates. What good are soldiers if they can cower while the people they should be protecting are defenseless? The present crisis will pass, but the next generation will remember our sins. Civilian morale, already tenuous, may not survive the abandonment of women and children to the Lufa office predations. Important voices of the administration believe that we must defend our most vulnerable as to not lose sight of the morals that drive us. The bombers will not wait for us to make decisions. Better to save one group now than to deliberate and lose both. How can we speak for the workers if we don't defend them? Increase the population growth? We can we can mourn the civilians when we take in Moscow. Um, increase army organization. Well, we currently have monthly populations plus 5%. That's actually not looking too bad. But really, monthly population, it's at least in my opinion, it's never been really that useful just because of the time 
uh, the short time span, the time period that we're playing in. So, I mean, it's one thing if it's the end of the new beginning, where you're playing like 20, 30 years. So, but we're playing up to 10 years, so it's looking at the more worse part for now. <clears throat> Off the clock. The system's put in place to prevent any significant damage from the bombing took some time to bear results, but it appears that they are finally working their magic. The ordinance rained upon us from the Luftwaffe now detonates in unimportant locations while our more critical infrastructure survived raid after raid. Meanwhile, deaths caused by the bombings have witnessed a noticeable decrease over the last few months. Once again, our people are feeling safe going about their business on the surface so long as the proper precautions are followed, and for the most part, we do not no longer have to fear the coming of the Luftwaffe. Now that we have room to breathe, perhaps the time has come to start figuring out the ways to clip the fascist wings. It's interesting here, if you look up here, doesn't have the National Spirit Lufa terror bombing? We don't have to do any of this. We can just sit here and just collect political power, I suppose. So, like, but we're going to keep doing this way, but that is an option. You can just sit here and just collect political power, if you really wanted to. But, a Black Marshal's daughter. Yelena Karbysheva sat down at her kitchen table with a folded morning paper. She thought about how to how to schedule her day. She had to stop by the grocery to pick up some food and do her laundry and prepare for the tax man coming by by tomorrow. She was pretty sure she had enough save, but it never hurt to double check to make sure. She was thinking about all these things as she opened up her morning paper uh, to the front page, only to see her father's face plastered over it. Below it, she also read the words, Death of the Black Marshal, Russia Rejoices. All at once, dozens of emotions bombarded her. Rage at her father for abandoning everyone to leave for Omsk. Pain at what her father had become. Sorrow for not having seen her father before he died. A rush of memories flooded her head as her emotions overtook her. From the last time she had seen him in Tiamen before she had, she had left, or he had left, to head south. So earlier, when he had just returned from the West Russian War, I broke command of those long nights she had spent in her younger years worrying for her father as, she fought, as he fought abroad. She tried to calm herself as she thought back all the way to before the war, before the, before either war. It had been the summertime, and she couldn't have more, been more than 12 years old. Tatiana had been four, and Alexia had still been just a baby. It had been a warm summer, and they had left to enjoy a picnic in the countryside. She remembered her mother laughing as Alexia fussed with his food. Even her father had been smiling. It was the last time they had enjoyed happy been happy together as a family. The anger and anguish threatening to boil over inside herself settled, settled to a simmer as the memory calmed her. The shaking stopped and she slowly opened her eyes and gazed upon the paper once more. A single tear fell down her cheek as she stared into the eyes of the father in the paper. Hope you found peace in the end, dear father. Oh boy. Oh boy. Worried for off the clock. Clock breaks. Fixing the Republic. Ah, oh, yeah. Pertinent manners. Maybe you want to do this one as fast as possible, then do rebuilding an army and such like that. Because you want to be able to conquer and core as much as possible first before you want to do all this stuff. Probably, maybe? Per perhaps? Maybe? Maybe I'm wrong. Nice. Mikhail's proposals. Off the clock. It might be thought that the man like Lazar Kaganovich, who made exceptionally harsh demands of others, would do so out of personal laziness. The opposite was true. Kaganovich was a workhorse. He could usually be found at his desk office, surrounded by a dense cloud of cigar smoke as he poured over documents, breaking up the monotony with the occasional shot of phone call. It was in the state that Mikhail, his brother and economic minister, found him as he prepared to deliver a stack of papers. Mikhail stood in the doorway, coughing as the smoke invaded his lungs. Although Lazar was actually the younger sibling, he couldn't help but feel intimidated, but Mikhail buried his feelings. They were brothers, after all, and this was important. He waited for Lazar to acknowledge his presence, but the chairman's work continued unabated, either because he didn't hear Mikhail or because he didn't care. Mikhail cleared his throat. I have some proposals I'd like you to read when you have the time. Hmm? Of course, of yes, Lazar replied unconvincingly, his attention clearly drawn to the already impressive pile on his desk, seeing that his brother was still standing there. He spoke again, clearly irritated. Do you have any other concerns? I'd like to get back to work, if you don't mind. Mikhail awkwardly took his leave. Although he would rather put faith in his brother, he, he knew instinctively that his stack of proposals would go on red for a good while longer. Not the rosiest relationship, but it is still a relationship nonetheless. Uh, how much manpower does Sverdlovsk have? Because we can beat the crap out of them and have them... Okay, never mind, they have 38,000. Omsk looks more tasty to beat up than those guys. Yeah, you know what? We'll do them. Oh, crap. Maybe I shouldn't have. That's a big river. That is a big river. My bad. Oh, boy. Yeah, we might not be able to win here then. Mm hmm. Hopefully they just want to pay us off, so... Kostrama? We're still building some civvy factories. That's not bad. Alright, let's see what they say. They aren't perfectly strengthened, but yeah, this, this is a bad idea. Okay, never mind. They pay tribute. I love Omsk. I love Omsk. Omsk lover. Right here. You have an upgrade, good sir. Nice. Very nice. Anything else? Not really too much, no. Off the clock. And preventative measures. Necessary losses? Let's do that one. 
Despite our, all our efforts to prevent the worst of bombings from affecting our people, it sadly remains true that we cannot ever hope to spare every last person from their effects. Chairman Kaganovich understands this cool fact better than anyone, and knows that if he tries to prioritize both the rural and urban populations, neither will see any noticeable improvement over the current situation. There goes Madagascar. Therefore, it's decided. My apologies, uh, I accidentally clicked on enter. He's decided. <clears throat> Uh, the prioritize the protection of the urban populations of the Republic. Being more tightly packed population centers, the cities are more obviously more vulnerable to the bombs and the spread up farmlands. While the cities will benefit from the new bunkers to fall back on in case of emergencies, those who live in the rural communities will just have to make do with what they have next. Ooh, that's not good for those guys. That's alright. And the patterns shift. Lazar Kaganovich was frustrated. The German bombing schedule, which had remained relatively consistent for years, had changed. It was not a large change. In truth, things would not be too difficult to adjust and continue on course they had been up to this point. However, on the, his desk, we set a proposal, a proposal put forward by Mikhail to adjust the urban defenses in order to make up for the changes. On the one hand, simply continuing construction of the bunkers would make any changes in the schedule moot. On the other, adapting to the new schedule for the defense of the above ground infrastructure would be better for the short term for the people and morale in general. No matter what option was chosen, it would be a huge investment. The bunkers would provide a complete defense against bombs, and if the bombings ever ended, they would be useful for defending infrastructure against the other warlords of Russia. But at the same time, keeping the defenses flexible would allow for a quicker response to change in the bombings. Indeed, both ideas had promised, but only one could be followed in the end. The question was, which one? Pro adapt, increase population growth, libertarian socialism, Utilize the chairman's program. Increase construction speed. Um, I like the construction speed. That's probably be better for us. But libertarian socialism. Can we actually become libertarian socialists here? Huh. Maybe we'll try that. Monthly population is 5%. That's 8%. Okay. We'll see what happens. I don't know. And then black zones? Why not? We get a military factory. Our production capabilities are still much slower than they could be, and while the bombings are much less damaging than they were a few months ago, it would still be far too risky to attempt repairing the bombed out factories that were abandoned long ago. The lighting of these bombings does, however, provide us with new opportunity. Jim and Kaganovich has authorized a brilliant new approach to getting our armament productions back in working order. Weapon factories and arsenals are beginning to be constructed and spread out highly co confidential locations to help bolster our ailing industry. These locations are to be highly secretive and will be selected based on the likelihood of being discovered by the Luftwaffe, with the German be Germans beginning to show reluctance to bra fly brazenly over our skies like they once did. There do exist certain unassuming areas under our control that they have not seen much tension from the raids. Which is pretty good. Anything else? Not yet. And that's fine with us. Keep building, building, building. We have 5 out of 20. Look at that. Nice, nice, nice. Um, can we build more? I like building more factories. That's probably the most important one. But preventative measures, like going to the dentist. For too long, we have cowered at the mercy of the Germans and the Luftwaffe. No longer are we forced to scurry to our bomb shelters like rats while the fascists terrorize and destroy our lands as they please, with our weakened military completely and utterly powerless to stop them. Now have their bombs have been rendered worse than useless, and we have gained the opportunity to take action and inflict some terror of our own. With the aid of the advanced anti-aircraft weapon systems that we have acquired from various sources over the years, we can finally put them to use by establishing various weapon sites near locations where the bom German bombers are known to be too frequent. Once our weapons are in place, the cocky bomber uh, pilots of the Luftwaffe will be in place, or, will be in, or the Luftwaffe will be in for a nasty surprise when their seemingly helpless targets start firing back. Nice. Keep going for artillery. I love shredding enemies. Just shred the crap out of them. Please, please, please. And it's time to prepare a raid against Sverdlovsk. Yes, yes. Sverdlovsk, it's your time again. Um, actually, are we sure which... It's all blue here, so... Oh, yep, it is this area. Don't do that, that's fine. Give them an ultimatum. So much political power, I love it. Black zones. I know the military factory would be very beneficial for us. Because we could start building some APCs. Um, APCs are nice and all. Let's get some more rifles maybe first. And we actually have nine things of IFEs in reserve. Nice. Going up them up. Feeding the underground. Deep. Oh, look at that. Under the streets of the People's Republic, teams of men swung their picks and shovels to clear tunnels for the newest metro tunnel in the Republic. Vladislav Shapovalov swung his pick and split a section of stone. His crew were to finish the last section of the tunnel so the other crews could come to lay in the track. It was backbreaking work and never seemed to be enough, but it was a, it was work and that is more than he had in years. Vlad found that despite the danger, he found a degree of fulfillment in his work. The threat of tunnel collapse was a near constant in the new excavations before the supports were put in. He had lost a lot of friends to collapse most recently love, but even then, the work was worth it. It was drilled into their heads often enough now how important their line was, or this line was. The safety of their families relied on the tunnels. 
the tunnel, this tunnel in particular, was integral to ensuring that the factories were unaffected by the bombs and the safe factories meant better lives for the families. Vlad could hear the machinery running on the other side of the rock now. He knew it would only be a matter of hours before the tunnel was ready for further construction. As he swung his pick, Vlad heard the characteristic rumbling that came before a cave-in. He shouted cave-in and directed his men to the safe section further back the way they'd come. He was the last one back before the roof gave way and the passage was sealed up by meters of rock. This will come in handy later, which is good, 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 good. Oh, crap, it's up here. Oh, well, that sucks. Hopefully we can still win. Ultimatum. Uh, from Koki Uh, that's not good. That's really not good. Now is it? Preventative measures. Nice. Yeah, we might not win here just because I didn't realize it was going to be all the way up here. That sucks. That really sucks. Are you guys even moving? Yeah, we actually might not win here. Can you guys hurry up? Hurry up. Move. Move. No. Come on. The raid. That's stupid. I don't like it. It literally does not tell you where things are going to happen. It literally does not tell you. That's so stupid. But you know what? We've, we've we've done really, really well for quite a while here. Oh, crap. That's not good. Well, we, at least we got one guy in there. Oh, goodness. All right, Sverdlovsk. I'm going to beat the crap out of them first if I can. I'm going to raise Sverdlovsk to the ground. At least we defended here. Oh, that's so stupid. So stupid. Um, So we can't raid for a while now. That's so stupid. Like, we think it's going to be over here because it has this modifier over here. But no, it just jumps up here. So dumb. So dumb. I'd like to see an improvement to that, at least in the mod, so. But then again, you never know what's going to happen with TNO and its development. Oh boy. As a consequence of increasing our anti air efforts in the Rep Republic, refugees have flocked to our borders like never before. While we welcome the influx of newcomers to our depleted lands, this newly emerged rush to get to the safety our Republic now provides has not gone unnoticed by the German nemesis. We can attempt to help the refugees, but to try and save all of them would be inviting disaster, where it could have easily been avoided. The needs of the many outweigh the few, and sadly it may be necessary to sacrifice the smaller refugee convoys in favor of larger concentrations. While many innocents will, undoubt will doubtlessly meet a cruel death as a result of this, many more lives would be saved than if we try to stretch ourselves thin but trying to protect every last soul that walks into our borders. Lose stability, change of authoritarian socialism, increase our population growth at the cost of stability. Oh boy. Well, at least we still got two loot. That's nice. Um, let's see. We need research facilities and probably workers. No, let's do research facilities. Let's make sure everything's going up and we'll do industrial investments. We still have over 500 army ex or 500 political power, so that's still okay with me. But God dang, that's so stupid that we lost up here. Why? Why, Svedlosk, you have to burn unpopular demands or decisions. Despite our best efforts to protect the people of the WSPR's remnants, the endless bickering of the communes and their officials have never ceased. In fact, their dissent has only increased over the few months. Certain powerful officials claim that we are abandoning the communes and the people of the Republic in favor of more useful sectors of the nation and causing the misery of thousands. While these accusations are not entirely unfounded, this is just not the time to be arguing morality. Even if we were so foolish as to abandon highly important aspects of our nation's infrastructure and industry in favor of making sure a few people can plow their fields, they will doubtless manage to find things to complain about. We should continue our policy of pragmatism that has shown so much success in the past and ensure that these useless complaints fall in deaf ears. We get even less authoritarian socialism for more political power, which we don't really need, but we'll take it. We will gladly take it. Infrastructure, anything else? Can we get more loot? At least we're not getting raided right now. Ikeda. Hello, Ikeda. And then, for our survival. For survival, our Republic has, had to make, made, has to make many uncomfortable sacrifices in the name of ensuring the safety of the revolution and the prosperity of the nation. Many have given their blood and even their lives in the process, but the difficult choices that were made with the forever enshrined the last few months as one of the darkest periods in the nation's history. We aren't exactly proud of the cruel decisions that resulted in the loss of lives, but none can say it wasn't worth it in the end. The bombings have ceased for the most part, and the skies have been more clear than they've been in decades. People are once again coming out of their shelters and living lives they haven't, hadn't been able to for so long. With their safety from the German scourge secured, the time has come to honor those who have given their lives to ensure that this reality could become possible in the first place. May we never forget their sacrifices, in which we get more stability, more political power, remove... Oh, we actually removed the thing, but they didn't die yet. Okay. And then uh, final triumph, or, you know, terror bombing. Cool, for our survival, my friends. Scams for loot, so we can get beaten up. Hopefully not too much. Infrastructure's looking okay. And we have 15 factories, not bad. We actually have a positive amount of uh, motorized, a uh, slightly positive amount of support equipment. And we got some better artillery, good. We'll beat the, beat the hell out of our enemies. Let's get some more infantry equipment. So, like I normally like to do, one research slot on army stuff, military stuff at all times, and other ones is on industry at the very minimum, so. Gods of the North. It's already August 63. Not bad. Coca Chateau. Yes. Beat the crap out of them. They have horses. You beat the crap out of the horses, too. But unless they, uh... Well, you only beat them, beat the crap out of them if they're working for the enemy. 
for our survival. And then we'll probably do the clock breaks, maybe? The end... With the end of the effective aerial bombardment of our nation, we'll be able to rebuild the People's Republic. I want to go to war as fast as possible, but fixing the Republic. In the past years, uh, the West Siberian People's Republic has shrunk to a mere husk of its former glory. This dreadful state of affairs can be fully blamed on those who stabbed Chairman Kaganovich in the back when he needed them the most, greedily splitting off to form their own personal fiefdoms. Previously, our forces were helpless to stop them due to the constant rain of explosives they were subjected to on a regular basis. Now with the sky is clear, we can finally begin plans to unleash the full might of the Red Army upon those who have foolishly betrayed the revolution and split from a glorious republic. One by one, the rebellious statelets who insult the workers and peoples of the republic with their very existence will be brought back into the fold, and the nation will finally be whole again, which we get more worse support. Raid the crap out of them and beat them up. Beat the crap out of them, my friends. Oh, they... Oh, come on. Man, I don't want political... I want to beat them up so we can get their guns and stability and war support. That's a cheap way to get all that stuff. Yeah, but we'll go for more equipment right now. And? Beautiful. Oh, the clock breaks. If you'd like to read about that, please go right ahead. Very cool. For survival, fixing the Republic. Reunification day. We want to reunify our nation. A final triumph. Lazar Kaganovich was ecstatic. The programs he put... put he had put his being into had been a smashing success. The perfidious Germans and their bombs had plagued the peoples of the... People's Republic for so long that they'd gotten used to the bombings as an alarm of sorts. It would take much getting used to, but as the old status quo would be swept away in a new age of prosperity. However, with the success of the program, the bombers that were once the dreaded the dread of every citizen of Russia were now an afterthought. The people of two men lived their lives in the most carefree way they had in years. For the first time, the threat of the sudden death was practically gone from the lives of the Russian people. Lazar lit a small toast in his office, his inner circle around him, to successes. The policies that had been spearheaded by Kaganovich were ingenious. Under his benevolent guidance, the Germans had re rendered impotent to harm them. Under his guidance, the People's Republic would take its rightful place in the world, and he would take his rightful place in the stewardship of Russia. The Germans are impotent. A survival oh, oh, the survival program will no longer be necessary. We lost stability. Um, I'm actually okay. You know what? Plus 70% is pretty darn nice. I don't want to remove that, though. I don't want to... Hmm... I should not have done that, but let's at least maybe build this factory first, as fast as we can, maybe? Hmm. But pertinent matters? Yes, please. Of those who split from the WSPR in the darkest moments, none are so foolish and so misguided as their immediate rivals based in the cities of Sverdlovsk and Omsk, respectively. If we were to unite the Republic once again, these treacherous wraths must be dealt with one way or another. One of the most devastating betrayals was that of Marshal Rokosovsky and his Third Army. When the going got rough for our Republic, the Marshal stupidly decided to abandon a righteous socialist cause by inciting the entire Third Army to desert and form a separate military government to the north. Although their forces have been weakened by the desertion and infiltration, they are still a formidable force led by a highly capable commander. To the south lies the Black League, who are based in the stronghold of Omsk. Although this traitor general Dmitry Karbyshev is dead, the successor Dmitry Yazov has reportedly galvanized the League and is actively preparing them for conflict against us. While his base of power may not be secure as it seems, it may be best to snuff these monsters out before they become too powerful. All these traitors shall become our first target, and the final decision will have to be carefully considered. Good. 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 A thousand times good. Most good here. Buy more equipment, but reunification day. This afternoon, General Secretary Kaganovich announced the rebirth and reunification of the West Siberian People's Republic. With a magnificent speech delivered to th many thousands of assembled workers and the Red Army soldiers in the center of TMM. It is knowledge, not the gun, that is the most powerful weapon in the workers' arsenal, the General Secretary said, and armed with the immortal science of d dialectical materialism. As understood by the genius mind of Stalin, the working class will one day relegate their bourgeois oppressors into the ash heap of history. Extensive preparations for the reunification of the West Siberian uh, land are underway, including the mobilization. Oh, look at that. Of the army. An increase in the annual draft and the increasing of arms production to defeat the liberal counter-revolutionaries who have carried out the workers' lands, onwards and upwards. Passed over. Rage. All that he knew was rage. Lazar Kaganovich was pissed off. After all the work and sacrifice that he put in protecting the people of the People's Republic, he expected these people to recognize his efforts to give him the recognition that he was due. That dude Mikhail was taking credit for his work. The sheer scale of his efforts ignored in favor of those a preening egoist of a brother. He had worked too hard to be passed over like this, poured too much of himself into these projects to save the people of Russia from the predations of the German dogs, yet here he was being ignored and scorned for his past or his for his part and making two men run like a well oiled machine. Lazar seethed in his rage, simmering and stewing in his hate. The dude had done nothing for the people now that he practically cheered his name from the rooftops. How could have this happened? Didn't the people understand how much he'd worked for their safety? How much he had sacrificed so that they would not have to? How could they do this? This is absurd. Wow, look at that. Maybe we do have someone who can take the range from a Lazar. The Black State in the Cradle? I want to do the Traitor to the North. 
to hell with these guys. To the north, the traitor's Red army have established a formidable presence centered on the strategically important city of Sverdlovsk. At their head is Marshal Rokossovsky, formerly one of the Soviet Union's finest generals, who has foolishly decided to throw away his legacy of serving the people in favor of establishing a military government of his own in the region. The sooner we put this mad dog down, the sooner we can achieve our dreams of reuniting Western Siberia the People's Republic. While the Third Army commands a highly defensible opposition across the east at the river. The combat effectiveness has been heavily marred by mass desertions. With their morale in such a dire state, they cannot hope to stand a chance against the might of a red army. Good, good, good. Beat the crap out of them, please, please, please. Alright, so we're done with this stuff. We're going to go ahead and do some industry now. Old soldiers. In what way is Karbyshev's revanchism excessive? Barked uh, Starshina Lebedev. Sir, he places the nation above class, sir. The recruits cried out in unison. That was the last of questions for the day, Lebedev noted. Excellent, ladies. It looks like now you know that your enemies will. Staff Sergeant Gusev will review your marksmanship in a few hours. You are dismissed for now. The soldiers made their way out of the barracks room. Waiting until the last of them left, Andre Lebedev took out a bottle of vodka from his friend and took a swig. Day in, day out, he was telling the new meat about the hordes of the Black League. About Omsk, about him. Andre held back his memory by, as Karbyshev's aide, hearing the tips about leadership and tactics to the sunlight in his eyes. Uh, the sunlight in his eyes the day he returned still scarred and bloody. He took another drink trying to forget Karbyshev's long, rambling diatribes about the great trial and the inherent strengths of the Russian people. And the day he did not socialism, the revolution, and the Communist Party declaring his black league will stand for only the vengeance of war. Andre finished a bottle, his throat burning like his mind. We must make sacrifices for the revolution. Cut these guys down. We need it. We need men now. Hitler's dead. Goodbye, Hitler. Goodbye. And rally the loyalists. Oh, that's too, yeah. Although the Third Army claims to carry on the legacy of the Red Army, they are, in practice, hardly a Red Army at all. Rokosovsky clearly cares a little about furthering the socialist cause and runs his little state like a reactionary fiefdom where the military rather than the workers have the most say in the day-to-day -day affairs of the nation. This clear betrayal of socialist ideals has caused a great deal of dissent within the ranks, and the Republic has already received thousands of deserters wishing to rejoin our ranks to fight for the revolution once more. With the aid of a pro propaganda campaign aimed at encouraging further dissent amongst Fedlovsk socialists, we can widen the divides present as Rokosovsky's hypocritical administration and weaken his army's ability to resist our attack, which is a great, great thing for us. Cool. And all eyes on Rokosovsky. To the people of Sverdlovsk, how can you bear to live under a cruel military regime like only that has their own selfish interests in mind. Surely you see the hypocrisy in Rokosovsky's past allegiance towards socialism being thrown away in the favor of delusional Bonapartist ambitions. The West Siberian People's Republic and its chairman, Lazar Kaganovich, sees and hears your plight, and only holds your best interests at heart. When the Red Army crosses into the territories currently operated, oppressed by Rokosovsky and his military goons, know that our first and foremost objective is the liberation of the people and workers of Sverdlovsk. And the workers of Sverdlovsk and beyond. Rest assured, the old marshal will pay a heavy price for his crimes against the people, and order shall be restored in the favor of a civilian administration. No longer will the Red Army of Rokosovsky claim to protect you on one hand and rob you blind on the other. Our republic will fight for your liberation. And there goes England. Nice. Oh, we have actually have two more divisions. Nice. Good, good, good. Did they get bigger? They might have gotten bigger. Maybe not. I don't know. But at least we have six divisions now. And. It Led with even more infantry, which is good, 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 good. Muy bueno. Alright. Oh, Coco Chateau. Yeah, maybe we'll do them first, just because we can. Investments to do that one, too, because since we have so much PP anyways. Nice. Hidden Heroes? Good, good, good. Africa Shield? Very nice. And then, strike at Svedlovsk. The propaganda campaigns have come to an end, and the Red Army has been prepared. All that remains now is to begin the campaign to undo the treachery inflicted on us by Marshal Rokosovsky and reclaim his territory in the name of the people. The Third Army, despite being much weakened from their former glory, is still a formidable foe. They are well-trained, well-equipped, and their terrain is heavily to their advantage. Despite these advantages, however, the complacent drones under Rokosovsky's command simply lack the socialist zeal of our own troops, who have once never wavered from their duties to the revolution. Advanced brave soldiers and comrades put these reactionary traitors in their place once and for all. All. Nice. Let's go ahead and move in. Six divisions will make us nice and strong. They refuse tribute. Good, good, good. Just as we wanted. And I know this first episode, normally my first episode aren't this long, but I decided to make it this longer just because we could. Because I'm enjoying this quite a bit. And have we won yet? Not yet. And we won. Treasure. I love treasure. We should be led by Ivan Konov just because he's got level six attack. And you'll be led by level four Ivan. There you go. Beautiful. And I want to see if we can beat him up before we end this episode. But we'll see what happens. All eyes. Hey, if you like to read about treasure, please go right ahead. But we've got more political power. Very nice. 
followed up with what? Man, we're, we're doing quite well here. I love it, love it, love it. The black stayed in the cradle. Dmitry Kabashev, the hated general, betrayed a republic when it needed him the most, may be dead, but his legacy, dark legacy, lives on in the form of his successor, Dmitry Ayazov. Ayazov has already proven to be a potentially fearsome advisory, adversary indeed, and under his watch, the Black League has become more powerful than ever. If not dealt with soon, they could become a serious threat. The Red Army's planned campaign against the Black League will indeed be bloody, for these zealots are famed for their inhumane or inhuman discipline and ferocity in battle. Despite these advantages, however, they are lacking in mechanized units, and rumor persists that the Yazov's regime is not nearly as stable as it would seem. Whatever strategic course of action we decide upon, it would be best to proceed with caution when dealing with these crazy madmen. Alright, so do we have... Oh, You know what? These guys are going to have to encircle these guys first. We should be okay. Alright, there we go. Alright, move into there. Cut everyone else off. That'd be good. Um, Don't leave the capital just yet. They're going to move in, which is kind of okay with us, so... Okay, oh, let's do rebuilding a nation. A long period under siege has severely damaged our economic and political institutions. We were brought to the brink of extinction, but now that we are safe at the last from the bombings, the time has come to begin putting the state back together. Chairman Kaganovich has wisely, wisely put together a plan to repair our damaged factories, take the government out of the state of emergency, and reestablish our bureaucracy, reaching out to the people of Tiumen to bring them back into the fold after their struggle for survival. Soon, the Communist Party will have firmly put our state back from the brink, and the hard work of expansion can finally begin. Good, good, good. You guys are going to attack here. No, you guys are going to attack here. Just keep these guys at bay for now. That's the most important thing. Cut off, cut them off from the capital. So, all right, and do that. Zotalis provides arms. Um, if you'd like to read about this, please go right ahead. This happens pretty much on occasion, so we get some help from Zotalis. Cool. Are we actually winning there? Nice. That's going to be a little bit more difficult than I thought. That's all right. Alright, so, we go to Nation. These guys have been cut off. Help them out. We might still not be able to win here, but that's okay. I want you to move up here so we don't get cut off. These guys have all been cut off now, which is very good, but still. And we shall do... Oh, oh, we're building the factories. We're building the communes. Oh, boy. Population growth. Wives for soldiers. Whoa, wives for soldiers. Enforced farming. Land redistribution. Or rebuilding the factories. Hmm... You know what? Maybe I'll let you guys decide. Should we rebuild the factories, or should we rebuild the communes? But right now, we're going to be rebuilding the army. Regrettably, the military history of the West Siberian People's Republic has yielded little success. The Republic, faced by betrayal from within, fell apart even before being able to be reclaim or begin the reclamation of the rest of Russia. Now that we've been reduced to two men and its environs, it is clear that we will have to reevaluate our tactics. The military is maybe the most important component to the revolution, and the solution to our military predicament likewise mirrors that needed to ensure the rebirth of the Soviet state. Industrialization and centralization. The Red, Army, the Red Army will be rebuilt into a force that can challenge the strongest and so that can sooner restore proletarian rule to the whole country. Nice. These guys should be able to begin being very, very weak. Come on, if you can move faster than that. Come on, come on, come on. We do not want to get... We just got cut off because of your laziness, you pieces of garbage. Your literal laziness. Move your legs. Move your vehicles. For the love of God. Uh, they need to keep moving. Um, but, you know, I think I'll let you guys... Decide this one too. Should we do red armor? Visit the doctrines, homebrew power, armored power, or this route, or should we do the red army? Let me know in the comments below. But if you enjoyed this episode, I'm going to end it here. Leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when we will beat these guys up and beat everyone up else in West Siberia. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.